work and of course the trick when things don't quite work or, or don't quite make sense is to is to what? Go to the beach. Go to the beach. I like your thinking. Yeah, which beach? Could you beach? Ah, oh, it's a nice beach. Well done. Okay. Yes, in general, let's abstract that answer. That's quite a correct, precise answer. And more generally, what 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 should we do if things aren't working? Nothing. Nothing? Well, uh, yeah, it's better. That's 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 not the worst answer you could have given. That, that's quite good. Yes. Try a different approach. Try a different approach. Yeah. That's really good. That's a good answer. What's the main thing not to do when things don't work? What's that? Hit it with a hammer. Yeah. <laughs> the main thing not to do is panic. You've got to. Shh, 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 shh. You've got to now, and for the remainder of this semester, and probably for the remainder of your time at uni, and probably even for the remainder of your life, whenever things don't work, you've, you've just got to be mellow and calm about it, and not go to pieces. So if it doesn't work, think, nah and try again and think of other things and try this and try that and do the best you can. If it doesn't work, then yeah, go to the beach, see your friends, have some fun, try again tomorrow. But whatever you do, don't go to pieces about it because um, <laughs> it'll happen enough and, and, and you don't have enough pieces in you to, to, to have follow that as a sensible strategy. Okay, today we're going to talk about C programming. Last week, if you remember, was sort of an introductory week. We didn't do any C programming. Oh, we did a tiny little bit at the end. Um, we were just introducing you to the themes of the course and talking about the themes of the course and sort of getting ready to think about how you're going to approach the course and what the course is about and what uni's about and so on and so on and so on. And that was all interesting and good, but now we're going to write some programs. Let's write Hello World. I want you to be called Hello World dot, dot C because it's a C program. I'll put the program on this side and the compiler on that side because the sequence will be this side, then that side, this side, then that side. So let's get it reading left to right. We're going to create our program and we've... Um, Always going to start our program with a comment. Does anyone remember how we start a comment? Slash slash, slash, slash is, is one way. There's two ways in C of doing comments. But let's, let's do this one to start with. Uh, this is a test program. OK, hang on. Oh, this is a test program to demo writing C. C. By Richard Buckland. Now, you, you, this is just something you should do in every program. Just say who, who wrote it and when, the date. What's today's date? The 7th of March. It's not the Ides of March, is it? No. When are the Ides of March? 14th is next Monday. Oh, phew. You wouldn't want to have a lecture on the Ides of March. 2011. Now, if you remember, there was a bit of stuff at the beginning of the program, um, which we always put at the start of a C program. I do hate having to say to you guys, I'll oh, just do this and just believe me and this will just work. I will eventually explain to you exactly what we're typing now, but for a little while, you're just going to have to believe that. I propose that someone on the wiki create a page called Promises, which are all the promises I've made about things I'm going to tell you. And then if you could write in there, Richard's promised to tell us this, every time I say something, that'll remind me to tell you all the things. We have this rule in the course that you're only in the um, things you write, in the solutions you write for your labs, in the comments you post on the forum, uh, in the assignments you do, in everything you do, you're only ever allowed to use features that we've already covered in lectures. So that means if you know something fantastic that would mean you could do the assignment in half the time and no one else knows it, you can't use it. You can't use it. So the constraint is... Now, this often annoys people and they say, oh, that's not fair. I just know one command that would do the whole assignment in 10 seconds. And you're making me write it using the command, only the commands you've told us. But to which I would explain normally, well, actually, I, I don't really want the program. If you're writing a program to calculate how many students are in the class, I don't actually need a program to calculate how many students are in the class. I'm not interested in how many students are in the class. If I wanted to know how many students are in the class, I could write a program to do it myself. The reason I'm asking you to write the program isn't to solve the problem. The reason I'm asking you to write the program is I want to see that you can write the program. Yep, it's the journey that's important, not the destination. So the fact that you could do it in one line, sure, or you could buy a program that already does it. 
Yeah. Or you could pay someone in Holland to write a program to do it. There are all these faster ways of getting to the endpoint, but actually I really care about the journey. So I, whenever I set a task, uh, the hardness level I've pitched it at is, um, it's, I think, the right level of hardness given what you know. And sure, there might be things you know, extra things you know unofficially that would make it even faster, but I, know, I don't want you to use them. So, so don't explain things uh, on the forum is what I'm coming back to that we haven't yet covered in class because then people will get confused as to whether they know them or not. You can, in the discussion section on the forum, talk about whatever you want, including extra crazy stuff. But in the official course content section of the forum, please only talk about stuff that we've covered so far. So um, finish, 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 finish. Finish, better than Danish. OK, um, where did this hate from Danish? <laughs> It's not hatred. I don't really hate the Danes. I've been looking up about the Danes on the weekend. They actually seem to be rel relatively cool after the period when they were Vikings and killed everyone in the world. But um, no, it's just we used to have the guy that helped me set up the wiki initially was a Danish guy. Uh, I don't like to talk about his name, but it was Julian. Uh, and uh, we were setting it up and setting it up, and then he just disappeared about a week before the course started. And poor Theo and Dougal have had to jump in and suddenly try and make everything work. So that's the reason things might look in a bit of chaos and sometimes things might not work in that this guy that was promising he was going to get everything delivered on time, it was all going to work, we paid him so much money, he just disappeared. And now these guys are trying to do it in a big rush. So, so because of that and because he's Danish, I just, we can't talk about the word Julian or the word Danish in the course. Cause it's just, does that answer your question? So actually I reckon there's probably some nice Danes in the world. Does anyone know a nice Dane? No one! <laughs> oh, you do? Yeah, who is it? Someone who went to Denmark, but he wasn't Danish. He's just someone going to Denmark. I need to know what he's like when he comes back from Denmark. <laughs> oh, he's back and he's still okay. Okay, yeah. Okay. All right. It's possible. Go back to the schedule. Oh, here's the schedule. You're just taking notes for the lecture now. And click on today's lecture. And eventually... Eventually, it says the page doesn't exist. There are no notes for today. So at this point, what would you say? I'm going to make the notes for today. So you go create page. And now you've made a page on the wiki. Good on you. And here you write whatever we did in the lecture. How about we say, we put a heading on. Heading start with equals. So if I might say, lecture four. in which Richard writes a program in C. Eventually. <laughs> uh, one, he one equals means it's a big, enormous heading. Two equals means it's a slightly smaller heading. And three means it's a tiny little heading. And now if we save the page, look, look we've just created a page on the um, thing. We could. We could all get together and create an encyclopedia like this. And that idea would never catch on. <laughs> I don't know why no one sort of that. Um, OK, now we just have to wait. That's the only problem. It's really important to learn about waiting in this course. Waiting, waiting. I hate waiting. I hate waiting. OK, so there's our lecture notes. So now, you guys, I don't really want you to write on this page, mate. Oh, internal server error. I don't really want you to write on... See, I didn't even get phase. You see, I just clicked on it again. <coughs> this is the computing way. We don't get phased. I think Julian set it up so that just occasionally weird things happen. I think he's hidden some Easter eggs in there, in fact. Okay, so we're going to um, create a sub-page where you're going to write your notes. And what, should we call it student notes? Is that a good name for it? You could change the name. I'll, I'll just... If you want to make a link, it's double square brackets. There's a link somewhere... You have to hunt round or search. Go to the search button at the top, I guess, and search for help. And that would tell you all the stuff I'm telling you now. But links are double square brackets. And you just say the name of where you want to go. So where do we want to go? We want to go, we're going to call it student notes, aren't we? If you start it with a, a, a slash, it means a sub page of where we currently are. So it'll, you see, I'm pointing at the screen now. That's not going to work. You see here, there's this long chain that we've gone down to get where we are. And that's sort of mimicking what's happening up the top there. So we sort of want to have student notes appended at the end. We want to slash, well, really, we want up here a slash, then student notes. 
So the link I make is going to have a slash in the beginning. I'm just going to say slash student notes. How about that? Okay, and let's give it a real name. What do we want to display there? Our notes. Say, there you go. And I'll save the page, and then eventually you'll see the words our notes appear on the page, and it's a link, and if you click on it, it'll go to the student's notes page, and you guys can stick a, a ton of stuff in the student's notes page. And you'll all share each other's notes. Oh, there we are. It worked. Our notes, if I clicked on that, it would go to the student page. The student page doesn't exist, so what will it say? Yeah, this page doesn't exist, you want to create a page, and you'll say yes, and then you would type in the notes. Now, the two um, dilemmas I wanted to give you were just two sort of problems we think about in computing a lot. Let me give you one of them now, and I'll give you the other one on Wednesday. The one now is, most programs, I think I told you before, are written by teams of people. I think we had the example of one of the companies yesterday used teams of 30, but large teams of people work on the software. What do you think are the problems with having 30 people all trying to do one thing? What could happen? They all have different ideas? They all have different methods. What's the problem with different ideas and different methods? Uh, yeah, that's a separate problem. Can you hold on to that for a sec? Just wave at me in a sec, because that's the point we want to talk about next. That's a good one. Um, but what's the problem with everyone doing things a bit differently? Different ideas, different methods? Oh, yeah, well, in the end, the program's going to look like a patchwork quilt, isn't it? It's going to be confusing. You read through and it sort of goes one way this and one way that. Maybe the methods don't even fit together, but maybe they do, and it's just, but it's still very confusing if one person says, we have to write all our comments in French, and someone says, we write all our comments in English. Someone else says, we put all our variables at the top. Someone else says, we put all the variables. You know, it's just very confusing. Um, and the second point was, was it you? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, you might have many people trying to work on the same thing. That's really awkward, isn't it? Have you ever tried to do that in the kitchen? Too many cooks trying to cook the one thing in the kitchen. You're all trying to make a bagel or something like that. Uh, yep. Uh, it doesn't work. So we have this problem of people bashing into each other. And, and So this is a question that I'm asking you. It's not a solution. How do you think we can solve that problem in computing? How are we going to solve this problem? No, it's not, I don't want you to answer it. I want you to think about it. Because it's not something that has a simple answer. And it's not something that's even been satisfactorily solved yet, though there are lots of techniques that go towards addressing it. How can we get many brains working together to sort of act as one brain, really? How can we all join a sort of hive? How can we work together so collectively we do something without getting in the way and bumping into each other? And the, I want you to start toying with this, because this is a problem we're going to come to again and again in computing. And those that manage to solve this problem manage to go on and do amazing things. You guys writing the course notes are straight away going to hit this problem. Because I bet one of you will open the page and start writing the notes, and another one will open the page and start writing the notes. Whoever saves it first gets in first. <laughs> Whoever saves it second <laughs> overwrites the number one. <laughs> How are we going to solve that? That's a tricky problem. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we just have a rule that only one person can edit it at a time. Mm, that doesn't sound so good. Now we've linearized it. We've lost our concurrency. We've made it serial. We've serialized it. It's called concurrency control techniques like that. Maybe concurrency control is the answer, or maybe there are other answers. So just think about that problem. Let's go back to our C program, because I really want to write a, a decent program to do something amazing. Uh, so here's the promise. I promise I will tell you later on what all this stuff means, but at the moment we just say int main arg um, int arg c char star arg v bracket uh, oh, yep, thank you. Uh, yep, that's fine. Everything's cool. Um, and then our program's going to say return exit underscore success. Is that how you spell success? Thank you. C is so good. The more C you have, the better. Now... Exit success is in capital letters. Let's just look at some interesting features of this program before we do anything else. C really cares about whether things are in capital or lowercase letters. So if you just wrote down the words and didn't pay attention to if they're in capital or lowercase, you could run into trouble. If you'd spelt main differently, it would be a different function. There's one function spelt entirely in lowercase and one function with the uppercase M, and C regards them as different functions. So in your program, is that a good thing to do? Is it good to have two functions with almost the same name but with different capitalizations? <laughs> if you want people to kill you, it's good. You don't want to do that because often when you're describing a program, or if you're like me, when you read it, 
when I read a code, I, I verbalize it. I don't know, you might be visual, I'm more auditory, I think. So I speak the program. And you don't want to have two names that speak the same but mean different things. It's terrible when you're reading your code. So all these words have to be lowercase. And in fact, lot, most things in C are lowercase. There's only a few times we're going to use uppercase. And one of them is here. When we have something we call a constant, a number that has some special meaning, we're going to write that constant entirely in uppercase letters. And because entirely in uppercase, if we ran them together, you wouldn't be able to see where one finished and one started. We put an underscore separating them. The return value here actually should be returning an int. So it's expecting to return a number. So I could just return 1 or 0 or something like that. But there's a special number you should return that tells the operating system that the program succeeded. And every C program does this. At the end of the pro every proper C program does this. At the end of uh, the running in an operating system, at the end of running, it tells the operating system, I worked or, sorry, I didn't work. And it does it by sending a special code back. And if you're really good, you'd remember the different codes and what they mean. But if you're like me and completely hopeless and vague, you never remember any codes. But that's okay, because the codes have names. So you just say exit success, and C will replace this word, exit success, with the actual number that is the exit success code. Now, how does C know what number to stick in there for exit success? Well, it's defined in a file, so we'd better include that file. Uh, so we go hash include studlib.h. Studlib.h is a whole lot of stuff. In fact, if you're on a Windows or Mac machine, you could even search, once you've installed C, you could use your finder function to find a file. Search through your whole PC hard drive and look for studlib.h, and you'll find it'll be a program, a, a file, text file, hidden somewhere inside your, um, your in install for GCC. And then you could open that and read through it. Look at it, and you'll see all the things it defines. And halfway through that file, halfway down through that file, it'll define what exit success is. And normally, exit success is zero. Zero, yeah, yeah, yeah. So studlib.h has got it. We've defined exit success. We've written our program. It does nothing except I worked, but it doesn't actually do anything. Let's just compile it and check as a start. Let's compile it. Do you remember the command to compile? GCC negative wall negative where are, notice capitals and lowercases here, negative O capital, negative O little O called, what do I call it? Hello, and the program's called hello world.c. Oh, that's very big. Let me just stretch the window out so you can see the whole window there. There we are. That's our command line to compile it. Oh, no errors. That's slightly alarming. We'll look now ls, and we'll see there's our program, and it's also made hello. Hello world.c is a program written in C. This is a program written in machine code. And GCC converted, made this for us out of that. It, it compiled one into the other. And if we wanted to run it, we go dot slash hello. Sometimes you have to put the dot slash in and sometimes you don't. I'll just always put it in so it'll always work. Dot means where I currently am. Uh, so dot slash is the current directory. So that's saying run the hello program that's in the current directory. And if you remember, we just made a directory. We've moved into it. We're saying now run the program from that directory. And ooh, it worked. And it succeeded, but it didn't print anything. OK, now we're going to do some quick stuff. We did printing before. Do you remember how to do printing? Printf, you can just say printf whatever you want. What about hello, Denmark? Oh, let's say hello, Julian. Hello, Julian, wherever you are. Maybe one day we'll see him again. OK, I'll save it. I'll compile it. Oh, oh, look at this. Oh, no, what happened? Now, an error. We always expect errors. So do we freak out or are we happy? We, we're secretly relaxed and relieved. The error message is very, very big. But normally, there's only one part of it that's important. And part of the trick of learning how to program is to relax when you see a big wall of text like this and just scan for the important words. I normally start at the top and go down because that's the order in which C prints out the messages, the order in which it finds them. And once it's got a bit confused, then everything after that confuses it. So let's look for the first time it goes off the rail. That'll probably be the one thing we have to fix. Uh, in the function main, hello world.c, error, implicit declaration of function, printf. Oh, we saw that before. Do you remember what that means? doesn't know what printf is. We've got to tell it what printf is. Let's go back to our program. Printf's defined in a program called, do you remember what it's called? 
stat.io. That's right. So slash include. There we go. Oh, long time to even get it to print and say hello. Oh, oh, more errors. Let's have a look now. I'll just put some blank lines in so that stands out a bit more. Uh, missing terminating character in main on line 10. Ah, line 10's here. Control C and Pico tells you what line you're up to. That's line 11. So what's happened here? Let's run those two lines together. It wrapped it. Pico does wrap lines when it thinks they're too long. What about I just say, I'll just backspace and say, no, don't do that. Don't wrap them. Delete going backwards. You, it really should be just one line. And now let's compile it. Uh, there's no new line there? There's some funny new line? I'll put it inside the quote. Let's have a look. Oh, that's okay. I think that's okay. It printed out, hello, Julian, wherever you are. Um, that's right. I'm literally printing out, hello, space, Julian, space, wherever, space, you, space, ah, dot, 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 dot. And what's the last thing I print? I print a new line. I say to the screen, drop to the new line now. And printing new line on the screen makes it go to the next line. So that's why what the operating system printed then appeared on the next line, because I'd already at the end of here said drop to the new line. So that's sort of what we wanted. Okay. Now let's look at some more interesting things. Well, can I print a number? Print F. Look at this. My fave number is 5001. Print F. What's my favorite number? 42. Now I could do this. I could just print the number 42. Normally I put, notice the strings of letters when I was printing out a message before, I was putting them inside double quotes. In C, whenever you've got a message that's made up of words and letters, you put it in double quotes. And C regards numbers and words as being quite different things. So let's see if this will work. We've told it to print out my favorite number is, and then we're printing out 42. Okay. Hello, Julian, wherever you are. I didn't save it. Oh, who would have thought that that could happen? How annoying. I'm sure that will never, ever happen again. Oh, error. Line 13, passing argument 1 of printf makes pointer from an integer without a cast. Now, this is really the problem, but you don't even have to understand that. You just have to see line 13, there's an error. Argument 1. Uh, well, is argument 1 the first argument? We can't be sure of that, can we? Because we're programmers. Maybe they're talking about the second one. Maybe they're starting at zero, but in this case it looks like they are because it only has one argument. Things you pass in are called arguments. So it doesn't like this because if you want to print a number, you've actually got to tell it how you want to print it. So you do that by giving it a string and then giving it the number. And the string says how you want to print the number. So the number could be uh, print an asterisk on either side of the number. How else do you like to print numbers? Just an asterisk on either side is probably good enough, isn't it? And percent D. Percent D means printed as a number, a decimal number. So it's going to print asterisk, a decimal number, and an asterisk. And where's it going to get the decimal number from? It'll get it from the second argument, which is 42. <coughs> ah, my favorite number is star 42. Okay. Now we can even combine those things together. I could just say my favorite number is percent D. And then I could pass in the number and I could say 42. Oh, we want to put a new line in? Where would I put new line? Would I put it at the end here? It's the end of the string that I'm printing out. So let's put it there. Put a space before it just to make it clear where it is. All right, my favorite number is 42. So it's a very simple program. Now, Suppose that number could change. Different people might run this program and have different favorite numbers. We might want to have a place we store someone's favorite number. And that's an integer. So we could say, hey, C program, set some memory aside to store an integer. And call that integer, we could call it if we were mathematicians, call it x. And down here, just print out x. And we'd better say what x is equal to. What do you want x to be equal to? 
9001. Okay. So this creates an area of memory called X, gives it the value of 9001, and then down here it prints it out. Okay, that's pretty cool. Here's the last bit of syntax. You can, if the number is bigger than 9,000, you can print out a special message. If X is greater than 9,000, you could print out, what would you want to print out? It's over 9,000. It's over 9,000? What does that mean? You guys are weird. Prince, I like cheese. All right, that's if. Now, let's look at what I've done there. I've done some indenting. Have you noticed, first of all, every line in the program so far is indented? How far did I indent them by? Two. That's not enough. Every line should be indented by three. There we are. And that tells me, just visually scanning through the program here, that these lines all belong together. See, they all belong to this function. The first thing that goes in beyond three, these all belong to. This function started with that curly bracket. Where does this function finish? The curly bracket at the end here. That tells me everything between those two is the function. Now, here we are. Inside the function, there's another level of, another little special area that belongs together. If x is greater than 9,000, beginning of special area, where does this special area finish? The closing bracket. If it's greater than 9,000, then do all the instructions in the middle. If it's not greater than 9,000, do nothing. Does that make sense? And now we're going to compile this very, very simple program. My favorite number is 9001. I like cheese. It always prints the same number, doesn't it? That's not very interesting. Hmm.